So joining me on today's Dismantle Ideas podcast, we have um, scientist, uh, biospherian, uh, and you may know him from the recent documentary Spaceship Earth, uh, and author of, of books including Life Under Glass, Dr. Mark Nelson. It's an absolute pleasure to see you in the flesh, albeit virtually, today, Mark. Likewise. Great to join you and your listeners. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's, a, it's honestly an honor to, to have you on. Um, and you're over in New Mexico, right? I am. We have an organic, well, we have Synergy Ranch for people who saw uh, Spaceship Earth as an organic orchard and vegetable operation, publishing company, Adobe buildings that we built uh, from scratch in the early 70s, etc., and going strong after 50 years. It's incredible. So, so you're as busy as ever then? Yeah, busier. Busier than ever. <laughs> <laughs> I think you said to me earlier earlier this week when we were when we were discussing this that um, the farming is becoming very. Uh, it's it's a key peak time for you at the moment. Oh, it is. Yeah, I mean, we're pushing uh, kale and chard and beets and squash, and you name it, out the door at a at a dizzying rate. And it's so it's so satisfying. This ties back, of course, to bias for two and our beyond organic farm. But I take really great pleasure in working with nature. And, you know, nature tells you you're not in charge. But if you do things right and listen to to us, you know, <laughs> you'll get production and delivering really clean, beautiful food to our local communities and CSAs and co-ops is marvelous. That's brilliant. It must be very fulfilling. Tis. Absolutely. And, and and was that was that always an interest of yours, uh, even before you got involved uh, with the whole sort of team at Biosphere Hell no. 2? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a total New York City kid. Uh, first generation, my parents were born in Russia and Polish, Poland, you know, Jewish, upwardly mobile uh <laughs> Uh, people, but totally, you know, totally city people. Although after I came to Sinegia Ranch and my mom visited, my, my dad had passed away. She remembered growing food in Poland. And I'm sure my dad, my dad's family used to grow potatoes, make it into vodka. And that was one of their cash incomes. So I'm oh, not wow. that far removed from being a good, a good uh, man of the earth and eco eco tiller. <laughs> have you have you yourself turned uh, potatoes into vodka recently? No, I haven't. Uh, actually, Sally Silverstone, in Bias for Two, we did a lot of home brewing because there was no uh, liquor store to go to. So, uh, but I'm not a brewer myself, not yet. There's still time. There's still time. Yeah. <laughs> so th thank you so much for, for joining today, Mark. Um, obviously, Everything's been brought into quite sharp focus with the release of the Spaceship Earth uh, feature length documentary. Um, do you just want to, you know, in your own words, speak about, um, you know, how how you got from where you did to being in Biosphere 2 and the, the sort of the journey that Spaceship Earth kind of presents? Well, uh, I have really good luck, I have to say. <laughs> Maybe you'd say it's good karma. <laughs> uh, I had, you know, been in a family where all of the, you know, young boys uh, were supposed to become doctors, and if not a doctor, at least a lawyer. And I, so I went to, and I, you know, good academically, I went to Dartmouth College on a full scholarship, and you know, graduated summa cum laude. And my my brother was already in medical school, and I knew that. I wanted to do something more adventurous, more outside the envelope. And it was the beginning of the, um, you know, Earth Day was only a, a year or two in, in the future. Environmental concerns were on the horizon. And I ran into uh, some people who had worked with the group, the Theater of All Possibilities, what later also became the Institute of Ecotechnics in New York. And they said, you know, they're, they've bought uh, some land in New Mexico and they're starting a community and they're going to put into practice new ideas, and new approaches. So I came out, I wrote a, a letter to John Allen 
a letter, mind you, a letter. <laughs> Got a letter back, and he said, you know, our deal is come for a three-day trial period. And three days uh, went to a month. I got put in charge of gardens and trees. We had we had begun rehabilitating a really ecologically devastated piece of land, typical for unfortunately not just the southwest of the U.S., but a lot of a lot of land and and uh, mismanagement uh, that people do. Uh, so it, a few years later, we started an institute of ecotechnics and. That kind of, you know, I think speaks to what our concern was even back in the early 70s, is we knew that there was a conflict between business as usual, as we call it now, the world of technology, including how we farm and ranch and do pretty much everything, and the world of life, the eco. So we wanted to uh, start a new discipline, and we got registered in the UK, uh, and we still operate both in the UK and in the US. And we consult to innovative projects in challenging biomes around the planet. So uh, for people who know that this story is going to go to Biosphere 2, who saw the, the film or remember the project, it was perfect uh, preparation because we had ground truth and learning by doing and you know finding appropriate mentors and people at all skills levels. We had projects going in the rainforest in the tropical savanna of Australia, where I spent about 10 years starting the project in the World City in London, the October Gallery. Anyone in the who comes to London should check it out. We're very happening uh, trans vanguard uh, gallery. So I got involved. I was a co-founder of Ecotechnics, and since 1982, I've been its chairman, and we we consult to these projects. We have alliances with like-minded communities and and uh, endeavors and outstanding people. And we put together uh, for about 25 years annual conferences where we got to meet our heroes. You know, some of the leading scientists, engineers, thinkers, artists. We always believed that art and science should not be bifurcated. So that was the you know kind of straight. A uh, non-straight path that got me from New York City and Dartmouth College to to going in Biosphere Two in 1991. Quite the journey, quite the journey. And it goes on. We <laughs> have we have a we have a saying actually from a John Allen uh, poem to keep the voyage going, going and never gone. I love that. I love that. It's amazing to see you still. Um, taking all of this work into into your life still now it's it, it's fantastic i mean i mentioned briefly earlier that spaceship earth had brought the whole the whole thing the whole experiment your whole group into into focus again do you think do you think the documentary has generally had a, a positive or a negative effect oh i think it's been very very positive i you know i have a few quibbles but you know, they wanted to do a, a four-part series. So in a two-hour film, it's amazing how much ground they covered. And you can't do everything. But, you know, and looking at you, Matt, I can see you're of a generation who is, you know, you know, probably learning to walk or talk when uh, Bias for Two happened. <laughs> and, yeah, and for that generation, you know, they kind of missed. It was a worldwide phenomena. And I think one of the legacies of Biosphere 2 is that it reached hundreds of millions of people and it gave them an optimistic premise that humans can learn to, you know, learn to live with a biosphere in a very sustainable, beautiful way. Of course, there were problems because we were jumping into, oh gosh, a whole whale of unknowns. But that was the whole point of the excitement of the project. So that the film is now bringing that story to uh, you know a whole new generation and to a new time on planet Earth, because what we were concerned with and what motivated our work from the 70s and in Biosphere 2 is now front page news. It is no, you know, everybody knows we're in trouble. We have to change the way we do things, the way we think about the biosphere. So I just love that. Uh, Matt Wolf, Stacy Reese, and the other producers, you know, made this labor of love, and it's a very ins inspirational film. Are you still in contact with most of or any of the group that you were in Biosphere Two with? 
Yeah, no, I'm in contact with, with all of them. And in fact, we had a wonderful uh, 25th uh, reunion. We called it re-entry after the two years when we <laughs> opened the airlock and came back to Earth. And it was quite a momentous moment, I'll tell you, because uh, in that first breath, I knew that Biosphere 2 was a different world. It smelled different. It, you know, everything was different about it. Yeah, so we had a great reunion. And uh, I, I am going to plug and I'm going to hold up. There's a new edition of Life Under Glass. So if people are interested in Biosphere 2, you know, take uh, Spaceship Earth as an hors d'oeuvre. This will get you much deeper into it. And I co-wrote it with two of the other crew, Gay Alling and Sally Silverstone. So we published the first edition, actually, as we were coming out of Biosphere 2. It's now updated with research highlights and a introduction where we look at the relevance and the importance of Biosphere 2 for our current uh, situation. So it is the best uh, book for getting your mind around what was it like to live with seven other people for two years in a separate world. Amazing. No, no problem with any plugs. You, <laughs> it's, it's. I mean, obviously, as we've spoken before, I've, I've, I've begun to. I've not. I, I wouldn't, uh, admittedly, hand on heart. I haven't read the whole thing, but I've read. I've read a good few chapters now, and I, I can, I can totally uh, back up what you've said. It, it's, it's fascinating, and you know, we were talking about the human relationships and the human side of it, and and how those relationships developed, and you know. <sighs> You know, I think John Allen stated before you guys went in, and this is in the book as well, uh, humans were the most unstable element of Biosphere 2. We're always going to be the most unstable element of Biosphere 2. Did, did that end up ringing true? Yeah, but let me just do a little fact check. Uh, that, okay, <laughs> I mentioned a letter. Now I'm going to mention a telex. We got a <laughs> telex from... The Russians, the then Soviets, who are the, by far the leaders in space life support and closed ecological systems, and a wonderful, wonderful uh, scientist from uh, a Moscow Space Institute, Yevgeny Shepolev. He was the first man to ever spend 24 hours in a closed ecological system. His only companions was a big vat of green algae, which was regenerating water and air. Uh, uh, he could only eat about one ounce, one ounce of it. So he was the one who sent when we were about to put John out human experiment in a little test module, you know, a tiny version of Biosphere Two that we we did to test a lot of the engineering, how to make a, a, a building airtight, etc. So he sent that message, and it ended with, you know, remember, humans are the most unstable element in the ecosystem. <laughs> Have courage, <laughs> and yeah, I think that's true. And the human, the human aspect of living in Biosphere Two was one the most joyous, but uh, was also the most problematical. Uh, and, I, and I had lived, as I mentioned, you know, way in the outback of uh, the Kimberley region of West Australia, up in the north. You know, where you are not physically isolated, but you feel like you dropped off the end of the the end of the earth you know mm -hmm. we had modern communications we could pick up a phone and call friends uh colleagues etc cetera, etc cetera. we could beat people at the class but just being confined with seven other people as as wonderful a group uh as those seven other people were that's difficult and uh, i'm reminded of uh you know we all have a theater background people who came through the synergias and became synergists there's a wonderful uh, Sart play called No Exit, and in it, one character says, hell is other people. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and that's a reality. I mean, I you know, we're all human. We know dysfunctional family uh, gatherings. We know personality disorders. There's also cabin fever. And there was a power struggle, which the film captures, that was raging during the two years about the direction and management of the project. So that helped polarize the crew. Yet despite that, we worked together amazingly well. Roy Walford, our, our uh, in-house physician, as it were, 
said, sometimes I couldn't stand them, but we were a hell of a team. And I think that also speaks, that gives me hope. You know, even when there's conflict and, you know, factionalism, if you are united in a purpose, and the purpose was to make Biosphere 2 as successful and scientifically fruitful as possible, to make our world as beautiful and keep it is literally your lifeboat. Your health depends on the health of the system. What happens often in expeditions and in human groups, subconscious sabotage never happened. We all love bias for two, and we knew if anything in peril the health of bias for two, we were in trouble. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, you, uh, <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want anything to go wrong in there, would you? No, you know, and is it time to say one of the lessons of bias for two? And, and it's hard, you know, it's hard for probably most of your younger listeners to remember. But when we started the project, which started in 1984, it took seven years of design and construction and brainstorming and figuring out innovative ecology and, and technology. The word biosphere was really unknown. We had to spell the word biosphere to people because they didn't know what it was. So how has the world changed? I mean, people said, oh, you're 50 years ahead of your time. If we were to build Biosphere 2 now and say, we need to study biospheres because it's our life support system, and we need to study how to redesign technology so people can meet their needs and, you know, you need an infrastructure if you're going to make an artificial world people would totally get it. And that that's why we, you know, thank goodness the, the engineers wanted to make it a big box store like a Walmart or Target or I'm not sure the British equivalent. Uh, and our architects said, hell no. You know, even though we intended it to be a quiet research project, if we have the hubris or the daring, the audacity to, uh, to attempt to make the first you know, human-made uh, biosphere, it's going to be beautiful. And as it turned out, how, how wonderful it was, because people who come to the biosphere or even see its images are kind of exalted. Uh, a friend uh, who's in the film, Tony Burgess, once called Biosphere 2 a cathedral to Gaia. And there was kind of that sense, you know, we're all children of Gaia. We're all children of Mother Earth. We're children of Earth's biosphere. You know, so there was a, a great deal of humility <laughs> involved in, in even when you're daring, it's good to be humble. It, it really was a beautiful structure, wasn't it? It was fantastic even just to look at, not, not to mention what was inside, but just it must have been a pretty awesome sight to be just about to enter that fantastic, fantastic building. And then, yeah, I mean, that, that must have taken some work. Oh, it was it was astonishing. I mean, you know, almost everything. You know, we we look back. Oh yeah, so they went well, were in, inside for two years. The second crew was in there. Blah blah blah. There was nothing certain about bias for two, and almost every step of it was considered impossible. You know, for example, there were, there were uh, roughly six thousand glass panes on the space frame, uh, each about uh, a meter and a half in in uh, in dimension. And it was so hot in the Arizona sun that our people, the glaciers putting in the, the glass and, and sealing it, they had to work at night. And it turned out that our crew was mostly rock climbers, you hmm. know, who were pretty comfortable <laughs> with, with being, you know, bias for two as a human construction is pretty awesome because we planned the experiment for a hundred years and the hundred year experiment is still operating. That's another another story. Uh, so it was done, you know, with state of the art technology uh, at the time. I think in the book, it says, you know, there were seven one week mini trials before you went into Biosphere 2 proper, before you actually entered it. Um, how did they go? And were there any huge learning curves or, or curveballs that you didn't expect to have to deal with? 
No, you know, I mean, we've been training. There, there was a cadre of, we call them biospherian candidates who are operating prototype systems. And then, you know, one of the first things that actually went into Biosphere 2 before closure was the farm. So we we're actually growing crops in there. I, I vividly remember after I was offered a place in the first crew, and I think it was the first meal of, of food grown in Biosphere, I bit into some or, you know, took a, took a chew of some peas and, you know, almost lost a tooth because there was a small stone, <laughs> which was exactly the size of these peas. So, the you know, the screens didn't didn't pull it out. So, you know, there was an enormous learning curve. You know, I'd, I'd been already, you know, I planted the orchard at Sinegar Ranch. We did farming at virtually all of our projects. Uh, but to actually grow all of your food and look at a table and know intimately every food, how it got there from planting to weeding to harvesting to threshing to preparing in the kitchen, it was pretty awesome. You know, there were the little things that drove people crazy. I mean, there was a divided opinion. I think all the Biospherians were coffee drinkers. Yeah. So during the closure experiment, until until finally some of the later ones, there was no outside ingredients allowed. Uh, but some people said, you know, we're going to drink coffee basically until we go inside bias for two. I decided I didn't really want to go into withdrawal in my first days. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I and a few others, you know, stopped drinking coffee. And, and we didn't even have black tea inside. We had herbal teas inside. So, you know, the little, the little vices, the little pleasures like caffeine, you know, it, uh, it's a shock if you're really a heavy coffee drinker to suddenly go cold turkey. I bet, I bet it was extremely satisfying to know that every single thing that you'd eaten whilst you were in there was grown by your hand and cultivated by your group. It sounds like, you know, something that we don't have the luxury of much in in modern day society well we, i mean we could do if we had an allotment or if, if if we were so inclined i'm sure you do now did you ever feel like you were just sort of on a merry-go-round of constant constant production and constant eating and constant production and constant eating you know it could have been worse i mean kevin kelly uh executive editor at wired he was the one of the founders of Coevolution Quarterly, and he was a huge fan. He actually spent 24 hours in, in our test module, etc. Written about bias for two, but his fear was that we would be, turn into eco peasants, and we would be out there seven, nine, ten hours a day. As it turned out, you know, on average, uh, crew spent between three and four hours, five days a week, on the agriculture. Of course, uh, you know, Sally and Jane, who were more involved in it, spent some more hours, but it wasn't as onerous as uh, as you'd think. And it was astonishingly good. The only problem was we weren't getting enough calories. Our doctor, who is a world expert in nutrient-dense, calorie-restricted diets, he was ecstatic. We were hungry. And so it motivated us to become way better farmers. The second year, we grew about three tons more food. We packed food, and I was leading the charge. We call them victory gardens, what uh, American households did during World War II when so many farmers were away. They grew about 30% of the, of the nation's vegetables. So we put plants everywhere there was sunfall that wasn't being utilized by a crop. And also, all the plants were helping keep the CO2 down. So, you know, I, I've always been a tree hugger from way back, but mm -hmm. I have a special, in, in Biosphere 2, our close connection, and I hope we have a chance to talk about that at more length, was one of the amazing parts of it. You know, instead of just thinking ecologically and, you know, blah, 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 your body got it. You know, you're down to your cellular level. You understood that you were a part of this biosphere and you took you know, loving care of it. You did your job. Our job was to be kind of the personal assistance to all the life inside Bias for Two. You might you might express it. And it was wonderfully satisfying. That sounds like a, a fantastic sort of connection you must have built with everything and everyone 
inside inside the biosphere do, do you do you wish that you know people today could experience even just a, a little bit of that connection with with their living world around them yeah totally i mean when i give talks or write books or you know whatever i mean one of the points that i really make about you know what can we learn from bias for two is that reality that I was just describing, that is equally true for everybody listening to this broadcast. And it doesn't really matter if you're in a world city, in an office, you know, sequestered and quarantined at home. <laughs> you are part of the biosphere and you couldn't have a breath of, of uh, sustainable air, a drop of clean water or food without the action of the biosphere. And so, you know, to me, one of the great illusions is, and it's an unfortunate word that I try to avoid using, the environment makes it sound like here's, here's you or me or the human society, and the environment is something outside and alien to us. And that is not the case. You know, people talk about children, you know, the last walk in the, in the woods, what, what do they call it, nature separation? Uh, and that that's an illusion. We are we are part of nature. We're we're both a child of the biosphere and we are metabolically intimately connected with it. And that's a wonderful reality. It's much better than the illusion that, you know, we're an island. Absolutely. You said that one of the things or one of the main issues from being being inside the biosphere was the, the sheer amount of physical labor and how daunting that must have been uh what were the biggest physical challenges you faced when you were inside biosphere 2 well you know farming uh and and we didn't have that very many uh we had some some machines to help thresh wheat and grains and this and that but a lot of it was pretty uh you know primitive because one is we have eight people working uh for your American listeners, a half acre farm, that's uh, one fifth of a hectare. So it was intensive agriculture, you know, par excellence. And, you know, but some of the labor, you know, if you really got into it, and I think we all got into it, for example, you know, I'd been to Asia, spent time in Bali, et cetera, et cetera. We planted uh, rice seedlings pretty much like they do in Asia, barefoot, you know, in the muck, We'd, we'd raise the rice seedlings, you know, putting them carefully and progressing across a muddy field, a, a muddy uh, rice paddy. You know, so there was a lot of labor, but be, because everything in Biosphere 2 made sense, you know, as good as my life is, you know, working in an ecotechnic project, you know, as, as somebody in the modern world, I mean, we wind up doing all kinds of things that we have no re no idea why we're doing them, except it's required. <laughs> so one of the reasons that I and several other uh, first crew told management, we'll go back in for a second closure or a future one, because it was it was amazing. It was amazing to be in a world where every action counted. There was no small anonymous actions. Uh, and everything made sense and everything was designed to keep our biosphere healthy, keep ourselves healthy and maximize the science. Uh, you know, so, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of work, but because we had restricted calories and then as the oxygen decline advanced, you know, we couldn't have worked all day if we wanted to. In fact, people, you know, friends on the outside family said, you know, looking at you guys work is like you're slightly in slow motion hmm. and there's a beautiful thing that your body when it knows that it's got limited uh resources food and oxygen it you know it spontaneously conserves energy and does things efficiently and you know not with undue haste it was you know it seemed to cause quite a stir when oxygen was pumped in for the first time in in, in about eighteen months. Was it about eighteen months in? Uh, what? What? Why do you think everybody was so up in arms about that? And 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 obviously as well, the other question is, how did it feel when that oxygen was was pumped in? 
Well, well, first off, uh, you know, bias for two, the, the biggest mistake, and I, I was a director of the project as well as a biospherian, is that we put out press releases talking about the goal of the project, you know, to make a world that is completely separate, where there's no inputs or outputs. Uh, but that was a long-term goal. And, you know, privately, we called the first closure, the two-year experiment, uh, the shakedown. And a lot of a lot of our IT people, people who are looking at data from Biosphere 2 and from our test module, they didn't think we could stay in there through the first winter because CO2 would rise dramatically. So, if I, you know, if I had to do one thing over, I would have emphasized, and we did privately in meetings, all of the unknowns, all of the disasters and well, not disasters, but all of the unforeseen and challenging things that could happen. And what to me was beautiful about oxygen was that none of our consultants had ever said they worried about CO2 big time. We all did. They Nobody ever said, well, maybe oxygen will kind of mysteriously disappear from the, app, the, the air inside Biosphere 2. So it was a it was not a failure. It was actually a reinforcement of why we did it. But the media had kind of seized on a, a very simplified explanation of bias for two. It was a space colony precursor. And the whole point was, could we stay in there, survive, and nothing goes in or out for two years? And that was never the intention uh, of the project. So when the oxygen got put in, and you can still read endless, you know, media sensational headlines that, that prove that Biosphere 2 is a failure, you know, the experiment is over because they had to do that. Uh, no, you know, we, we had a tightly sealed system that, you know, just blew people. I, you know, I, I was doing interface with space agencies. NASA's closed system down at Kennedy Space Center was leaking air, exchanging air with the outside, five to 10% per day. We had less than 1% per month, which was really vital. If we had the kind of leakage that uh, other closed systems had, we wouldn't have even seen the oxygen decline because it was declining that slow. So, you know, kudos to our innovative engineers for achieving the impossible. And, you know, so, I think uh, Spaceship Earth well captures the media frenzy of, you know, these issues about perfect ceiling. But that was that, you know, that would have made Biosphere 2 a very, very expensive stunt and a very implausible stunt that you, you know, face so many unknowns and it's going to work perfectly. In fact, the surprising thing is that we did stay in there, albeit with uh, using some seed stocks for food and the oxygen insertion for two years. And so many things worked as planned. I mean, a lot of ecologists thought we couldn't maintain, in, you know, under the same roof, a rainforest, a savanna grassland, a coastal desert, a mangrove wetland, a living coral reef ocean. They thought it would all be invaded by invasive species and homogenize. So. That's <laughs> it was basically a media media stir. Should we talk about what it was like to an enriched oxygen after after living for months at what 16, 15, finally 14 and a half percent oxygen? Absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to hear how that was. Well, I, I started a previous book, Pushing Our Limits, uh, which kind of pulled together a lot of the science with the most amazing physiological uh, experience I've ever had was walking from that oxygen decline. That, that's equivalent, by the way, to being on a 4,500-meter 4, mountain, 14 to 15,000 feet in, in English terms. Suddenly walking into it, we, we wanted to very carefully measure exactly how much oxygen was put in. So we stepped into a uh, one of our variable volume lung uh, buildings, which had had its door closed. We stepped into 29%, I believe it was, oxygen. 
And in seconds, I felt, you know, I had transformed from a 100-year-old to a 15-year-old. And, you know, all of the crew that were in there, we started laughing like crazy and running madly around around that uh, that lung structure. And I realized, you know, hearing hearing running feet was something I hadn't heard like in a year. <laughs> <laughs> so it was astonishing. And, you know, so Biosphere 2 also, for the crew and for people who really contemplate uh, its lessons, there's so much that we take for granted that our biosphere does. You know, when Jim Lovelock and Lynn Margulis, you know, who came up with Gaia theory, and Jim was very much involved with NASA, you know, the, the first landings on Mars, how do you look for a habitable planet? Well, one of the ones, if uh, if alien life is anything like Earth life, is does it have a breathable atmosphere? And for the early history of the Earth until, uh, you know, life is the, the ultimate engineer and technologist, until life figured out photosynthesis, there wasn't free oxygen. Free oxygen was a poison because everything previously were anaerobic, were, were organisms that are killed by oxygen. So the fact that we have a 20, almost 21% oxygen atmosphere is totally take, you know, take a bow biosphere. The green plants of our biosphere are responsible for that. So, you know, I don't take breath and air, you know, casually anymore. You know, I, you know, everyone talks about mindfulness. And I think one of the most profound mindfulness is to, you know, really get in touch with your body and, you know, start to understand how inseparable you are from our biosphere, including that famous, you know, you know, stop listeners, hold your breath, ex exhale. Now appreciate that the biosphere is has put the oxygen into your next breath of air. I think that's such a lovely, lovely sentiment. And I think people could absolutely, certainly in, you know, I, li I live in a big city. I live in London. Uh, everyone's very busy all the time. I don't think anyone feels particularly connected to to nature as such. Uh, but we do try. You know, I've got a park very close by that I try and get out to. But there's no real sort of countryside or or, or proper proper nature that is that is that is handily available to me. So I think I think that's I think that's a, a great a great takeaway. If uh, among among many others, um, and we're just getting started, which is great. I think, you know, you you said that you felt more connected when you were in there because of your closeness to your whole environment and the whole biosphere that you found yourself in with, during Biosphere 2. Did you come out a, a changed man? And how was it coming back into the, in inverted commas, real world after that? Yeah, it was pretty astonishing. And I've I've looked a few times. And I, I guess, actually, there's a clip from my... Uh, you know, we all had prepared a little bit of a re-entry speech when, when we came out. And we were honored, you know, Jane Goodall was there, you know, Oleg Gazenko, the head of the most important space uh, institute in, in Russia was there. It, it was a pretty amazing experience. And there, there's a moment when I, I stepped up to the platform and I sort of took in two things. One is that, you know, you don't see stars very well inside a glass structure. <laughs> we could see fireworks, but they weren't that spectacular. But the horizon is kind of washed out. And I remember just looking out and, you know, it's at kind of the foothills of some mountains, uh, the, the site of Biosphere 2. And it was just so pleasurable to, to look at the various spectra of light and look out into, you know, the kind of horizons that you get, you know, outside on planet earth and the other thing is there was probably a couple of thousand people there and to feel the energy and emotional you know connection with other people that was one of our strongest hungers inside aside from wishing for food that we couldn't produce and drink that we couldn't brew was oh my god wouldn't i love to be at a party and meet strangers you know, rather than these wonderful, but oh my God, the same seven faces, uh, you know, 
2,160, I believe, meals during the two years. So it was quite incredible. And, and I know the clip in Spaceship Earth is living in a small world changes who you are. And it, it really does. Now, the thing is that Earth is actually a small planet. Earth is, you know, it, it seems large, but it really isn't. And, you know, I, I got my PhD after Bias for Two in environmental, really ecological engineering. And there's still people in that field who say that the solution to pollution is dilution. You know, if you've got a polluting factory or process, build a really tall smokestack and send it out into the atmosphere. If we've got nasty sewage or agricultural runoff or chemical wastes, you know, let's put it in the ocean because the ocean is so big. So I think, you know, the generation that's now alive on planet Earth, we're the first generation that really understand that the Earth is pretty limited. It's a, it's more tightly sealed than Biosphere 2. And there's no way that this, this is uh, an insight that some of our scientific consultants came up with. What was revolutionary about Biosphere 2 in such a small system where everything cycles really rapidly, there's no way you can't throw anything away. It's going to come back. You know, if we were stupid enough to pollute our water, it would literally be in our in our cups of herbal tea in, in two or three weeks. CO2 is coming in and out of the atmosphere, you know, every four to six hours. Uh, so there's but there's no way on planet Earth. And we're the first generation, you know, beginning to understand that. And that's going to inform our technology and our engineering if we're going to have a successful future, which I believe we will. How, how do you how do you best teach people that they are, in fact, also biospherians and to look after what we currently have? Is there a silver bullet? Is there, a, you know, a teaching or, or a learning that can be easily conveyed to, to today's modern society, wasteful sort of um, slightly blase at times society you know i wish that i wish there were and, and you know part of the dream of biosphere 2 and the fat lady hasn't sung uh, is that biosphere 2 would give rise to biosphere 3 4 5 10 100 500 in in all kinds of shapes and configurations and you know one of my dreams was that you know before a g8 or g10 whatever it is or united nations general assembly that all the world leaders would go into biospheric systems and experience their connection with life and understand that taking care of our biosphere is not something that we should only do when we feel affluent and virtuous. It's like survival. It is literally survival. And I wish that there were a magic way for people to get that insight. I, I love a quote from Stephen Jay Gould, uh, the uh, ecologist and anthropologist, he wrote, we have to fall in love with the earth because we will not fight to defend what we're not in love with. And, you know, so I say to people, and it's interesting from what I read about the quarantine, is people are now buying up seeds like crazy, planting house plants and, and little, you know, vegetables on their windowsills. They're getting enamored with the trees that they might see outside their apartment or house and get, you know, by all means. I mean, I grew up in, in New York City. I grew up in Queens, which has some spectacular parks. And I just defy it. You have to be a really damaged human being to get out in Central Park or Russell Square or, you know, uh, London and England is full of huge trees. You know, Europe is quite blessed and a lot of the United States is. Get out into nature and really experience how much you are at peace, how much better your organism feels. You know, there's a fancy word for it that E.O. Wilson invented, biophilia. This is this innate love of, of life that every human being has. We grew up in nature. Being urbanized and citified is like a really recent uh, development. And, you know, so I love that there's big movements now to green cities. Uh, I worked with a guy from NASA who is one of the leaders in indoor air quality, Billy Wolverton. 
you know, so getting plants in, into every space actually not only will make you feel better, but they will purify the air and you won't have a sick building syndrome. So one way or another, you know, get out of the illusion that you're separate from nature and experience it. I mean, experience, you know, there's got to be a tree, you know, close to you. Go and grok as they, the 60s people like I am say, you know, go and commune, meditate, be mindful around a green plant or a tree. Talk to it. Listen to it. Could, could you imagine, you know, you talk, I, I think that's a really lovely idea of getting world leaders into a Biosphere 2 type situation. I mean, it, you know, the likelihood of actually Getting them inside one of them uh, probably seems slim. Unfortunately, whilst it is a fantastic idea, could you imagine someone like a like a Donald Trump inside Biosphere Three? <laughs> wow! Well, yeah, I could. I could. Why not? How do you think he'd get on? <laughs> well, I you know who knows. You know who knows. Uh, I did, I did preface that thing that, you know, if you're sufficiently damaged, you know, by trauma, by mental illness, by, you know, you know, there, there are some people who unfortunately, and, and I, I actually blame, I think we need to rechange. I love, I love that your, your, your podcast is basically called dismantle because I think we need to dismantle how we live on planet earth, you know, and, and really radically reimagine what, life can be how cities can be what you know as probably you know anyone who's been to school has figured out isn't it funny that ecology and economics start with eco uh but the fact is that modern especially capitalist big corporate multinational corporations that economics has so little to do and has so little reverence or respect for nature that we have to rethink, let's reinvent an economic system that actually supports nature, including human nature. You know, when we destroy nature, we're also destroying part of ourselves because we are so bonded with it. So, yeah, dismantle and, and reboot. I don't know what Donald Trump would do in, in Bias or Two. Probably, probably improve his mood. Maybe he wouldn't tweet for a while. <laughs> he'd definitely have to not have access to his twitter i think um that would be that would be a very very wise move you, you you talk about dismantling the way that we perhaps live in our own actual biosphere that that we're all in at the moment you know if you were to if, if someone put you in charge tomorrow if you suddenly had a uh, a position of power within within the sort of the the u.s government for example how would you uh, and what sort of first initial steps do you think you would try and make to try and improve the situation at the moment? What would be what would be your first goal? Oh, wow. I mean, I'm really not an economist. I'm not a government type. But, you know, I, when I was researching, you know, books, uh, there are so many problems with what we do. I mean, one of the most terrifying ones is the use of chemicals that really have not been tested either for human safety or for environmental impact. And this is a good time to say, you know, part of our vision about closed ecological systems and our Russian colleagues are right there with us is we should, we should be using the precautionary principle. You know, so when I learned that the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, has only banned in its history less than 10 chemicals, and virtually virtually all chemicals uh, that were in common use were presumed to be safe. So I would say let's build, you know, and they don't need to be as elaborate as Biosphere 2. They, they could have just one ecosystem with a lot of diversity. And let's use that as a testing thing for new chemicals, new technologies. Uh, I don't know what to think about uh, GMOs. It makes me a bit nervous, but what really makes me nervous is that they haven't been studied in nature. So this would be a perfect use for Biosphere 3, 6, 13. Uh, release 
GMO organisms in there and study, you know, what they're doing. How do you think biosphere, bi sorry, look, I can't get my words out. How do you think biosphere three would look if you were to start planning it tomorrow? And in fact, actually, how about biosphere 10, for example? Do you think they'd all be wildly different or do you think they'd all be pretty similar with a few tweaks here and there? You, you know, by the way, Biosphere 2 gave rise to uh, a Japanese facility. It's called CEEF, C-E-E-F, Closed Ecological Experimental Facility, up in northern Japan. And it's very close to uh, a nuclear plant. So they've used it kind of like I was talking about. They've put radioactive materials into that, the, you know, into their system. They, they used to call it biosphere J either for junior because it's smaller than biosphere two or biosphere Japanese to see and study what radioactive materials move. And before the, the Soviet Union kind of imploded and went bankrupt, the people we were working with, they were really keen to do a Russian biosphere. And, and listen to this. So biosphere two, we tried to make is absolutely pollution free you know, a clean technology based as possible. What the Russians said was, that's really good, but let's use our biosphere in a different way because our country is really polluted. So the Russian biosphere was going to be, first of all, it would be temperate. Maybe you'd have tundra instead of savannah. The, you know, biosphere two was tropical or semi-tropical, but you, you know, for example, if one was done in London, in London or in England, you know, it makes sense to use temperate ecosystems. But the Russians said, we will start with a very polluted uh, biosphere. We'll intentionally make the soils polluted, the waters, you know, et cetera. And then we'll use that biosphere as a way to study how to clean up those ecosystems as kind of a laboratory for, you know, for regeneration and, and bioremediation of these pollutants. So there, there's almost an infinite way that you can move uh, and configure biospheres. And you could make smaller ones that would be research modules. Uh, when After Biosphere 2, uh, we created what we call the Laboratory Biosphere here at, uh, in New Mexico. And it's of a size that would fit in the cargo bay of the shuttle. Uh, it's got high intensity lights and, you know, soils in there for air purification, et cetera. So it's a field that's really very malleable. And what we were hoping Biosphere 2 uh, would kick off would be, let's take very seriously how to study uh, biospheres and comparative biospheres. So each biosphere that got made would be another example of a comparative biosphere. So they could be, in a way, talking to each other, and the data from all of these biospheres could be assessed and compared with similar processes on planet Earth. And, you know, for people out there who are not scientists, I mean, real scientists know that as much as we know about about nature, science basically means the investigation of nature. As much as we know about ecology, planet Earth, the universe, there's so much that we don't know. And, you know, so science is an ongoing endeavor. And, you know, when people say, oh, geez, you know, Biosphere 2 is so expensive. Uh, of course, it was the first of its kind. And you know, we had to do a lot of research and development that we wouldn't for future biospheres. But $200 million is the cost of one military aircraft, one, you know, military jet equipped with bombs and whatever drones. Uh, with the stakes that we face in learning how to live sustainably, regeneratively with planet Earth, these are really modest investments. I guess what's unusual is that ecologists and life scientists work on really skimpy budgets. And I think, part, you know, a little bit of the jealousy that Biosphere 2 invoked in, in some scientists was we had this amazing apparatus to work with, to play with, to experiment with. Uh, but when you think that a cyclotron and, you know, I think all types of science, they don't they don't need to be 
pragmatic and give cost benefit analysis, but a cyclotron might cost $10 billion or more. $10 billion, and let's say we can get the cost of a biosphere down to 50 million. You know, that's 20 in a billion. You could do 200 biospheres for the cost of a cyclotron. And, you know, the one good thing about uh, the change of directions, the University of Arizona now operates Biosphere 2. Columbia University did for five or six years uh, in the late 90s, is they kind of used it as a biospheric university. So I think every city should have a biosphere of, of some sort. Every major university should have one both for research, public education, inspiration. You know, if we can't get the G8 members in there, how about, you know, uh, people who win certain lotteries could go into a biosphere for a week. Your top students, you know, it'd be a great incentive. You know, put put uh, kids from minority uh, schools, you know, disadvantaged kids into a biosphere to give them that experience as well. You know, there should be ones in every continent all over the planet. I mean, that would be really incredible. Yeah. And make it available. I mean, maybe instead of a live in crew, maybe you'd have a couple, you know, like on a training ship, you have a couple of experienced biospherians in there. And then, you know, you'd have a rotating crew to give as many, you know, kids, adults, seniors, whatever, the experience of it, a taste of it. Because I have to say, you know, the only reason that I put my hand up to uh, start biospherian training is I spend 24 hours in that test module. And the first two or three minutes in that test module absolutely just rocked my boat. It turned my universe inside out because I understood that my body was not getting it the way my mind was. And for your body to understand that connection, to experience it, to experience it beyond words, really. I mean, all I can do is put some words on an experience that was deep in the body, deep in the body. And you look, you know, what's beautiful about a closed system is we may know theoretically that, you know, like I was talking about the oxygen that the biosphere produces. In a biosphere, you could actually walk around or in that test module, basically just look around and you could see all the green plants and immediately you understand they're waiting for my next outbreath of CO2 and they're putting the oxygen in the air for me. And your body gets that. It's not just a mental construct. Amazing. W would you would you go back in if you had a choice or if you had the option to go back in? If, if, if someone approached you and said, right, we're building Biosphere 3, uh, we want a... We want a Biosphere 2 veteran in there, someone who knows what they're talking about and someone who we believe is going to really help us, you know, make this project a success. Would you go back in? I would say yes uh, in faster than a nanosecond, faster than the speed of light. I have dreams of it, by the way. And I know a lot of my fellow uh, both first mission and second mission people I often have dreams that we are going back into a biosphere, either biosphere two or a new one. And like, you know, I, I love that they called uh, that film Spaceship Earth because Buckminster Fuller was a, a huge inspiration. We had the pleasure of, of, uh, of having him at conferences and counting him as a friend. And, you know, his seminal book was called Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. And it, that title, you know, kind of says it all. He says, you know, we're on this amazingly wealthy, beautiful, you know, four billion year old planet. And the striking thing is that we humans don't have an operating manual of how to behave, how to manage ourselves. It's not like we have to manage the biosphere. We mainly have to manage humanity, you know, starting with ourselves. So, yeah, I mean, in those dreams, it's like, uh-oh. You know, I'm not sure that I actually even know what I'm stepping into. And and the beautiful thing, you know, we were not biospherians. I think being a biospherian is like being an artist You, or being, a, a, a you know, in, in my culture, a mensch. That's both in Yiddish and German for a real human being. You know, but during the two years, we were on the learning curve of how to become biospherians. 
And the real humor to me is when the banks, bankers, the banksters and the lawyers took over bias for two, that they were madly look, running around looking for the operating manual. Well, the operating manual was in the bodies in the mines, both of the crew inside and a lot of our key consultants and you know, people working with us in mission control. That's where the operating manual was. And that's, you know, kind of, it was a beautiful thing to learn how to live with bias for two and figure out, you know, how to manage our activities, uh, you know, to maximize our positive interaction with, with that system and to, to take that to the outside. So you, that was one of the shocks of coming outside is that from a world where everything made sense and it was so palpable that, you know, you had to really make sure that you did the right thing. You're out in this world where I can see why people think it's hopeless. You know, I read all these depressing headlines. I'm just one person. Does it really matter if I recycle or if I, you know, get a hybrid or, you know, walk or bike to work instead of driving a car? You know, we have to change that mindset. And one of the one of the things that inspired me in Biosphere 2 is that I was the sewage manager. I was in charge of the constructed wetland that treated all of our domestic waste, both from the people and the, and the animals. And I love that system because we were doing it in a very green way as a beautiful wetland with flowering plants, et cetera. So I, w I went back to university to get a PhD and make, make these, I call them now wastewater gardens, because I... You know, I could sense with all my, my being that people need to have ways of being reconnected. So I also wrote a book called The Wastewater Gardener, and I love the subtitle we came up with, Preserving the Planet One Flush at a Time. And so we would make these uh, constructed wetlands, and we've now put them into about 14 countries. And I love that the people who, who have one, whether it's a hotel, a restaurant, a house, a business, they start falling in love with the, the wetland plants out there. And they understand that they have to be careful not to use nasty chemicals that'll go out because that could damage the plants. And, you know, so it gives them a mindfulness and, of a, and a connection. So just like we were talking about air, and I kind of end that, you know, that book with, uh, the feces, the fecal sphere meditation. Try to find out where your drinking water and your water supply comes from, and where do the wastes that leave your house or apartment go? Get connected with those processes. And then once we get connected with them, then we might say, that's really awful. Almost every sewage plant in, in the world, high tech one, dumps its partially treated waste into an ocean, a river, or groundwater. That is really sad. <laughs> That's a waste of <laughs> shocking. It's a waste of fresh water and it's a waste of the nutrients that they contain. So, you know, our goal when we do these wastewater gardens is to absolutely reuse and plants and microbes are nature's perfect recyclers. They will take your waste and make beauty and usable and usable products and beautiful plants uh, out of it. And you can do it in every kind of situation. We we did one uh, in the Algerian desert and we made it a crescent moon shape because that's an important symbol in Islam. Do, you know, going back a little bit to, to what you said about the everyone you know the if people to go into the biosphere too now the manual was within the people that essentially built it and essentially made it what it was do you do you think do you think there's a takeaway to be had that actually you know going from everything that we've discussed do you think the manual is within everybody that's living in this biosphere and therefore the more people connect to it the more of a future this planet's got Potentially, yes. Uh, and actually, you're reminding me that one of the beautiful things about Biosphere 2, which was crucial to it actually being as successful as it was, is that we had to attract top ecologists and top and innovative en engineers. 
And I realized, you know, working and sitting in on these design meetings that ecologists really rarely get to sit down with engineers and vice versa. I mean, my joke at the time was that th these two groups couldn't even insult each other because they were speaking different languages. So the ecologists, you know, usually when they hear the engineers are coming there, oh, my God, my beautiful forest, they're going to put a road through it, a bridge through it, and, you know there's going to be a housing development and the, the engineers, you know, they love really solving problems, you know, making elegant use of technology, but they very rarely get called upon to consider the entire ecological context. So like a spacecraft, every material and technology that got put into bias for two was kind of pre-screen for what was its, you know, byproducts, what pollution would it cause and could the biosphere absorb and neutralize it? And some, you know, so some solutions, though they were nice for the engineers, had to be rejected. And the engineers, they, they kind of mutinied because they realized that all the engineering that they were producing, which was really awesome and stunning, was not going to keep biosphere too healthy. Biosphere 2 is going to be kept healthy by its life. You know, so the engineering was kind of playing second fiddle. It was certainly necessary. You know, we, we didn't have a world climate system. We had to do that with engineering, you know, uh, make waterfalls happen, you know, recirculate streams, you know, do, do a thousand things like that. But all of that was uh, just in the service of life. And it had to pass that test that it couldn't pollute the biosphere. You know, one telling example was if you're going to have a living ocean and coral reef, you need to have a tide. And, you know, so here we are at a thousand meters, 3,900 feet, you know, in the foothills of the mountains in Arizona. We're crazy enough that we're going to put an Everglades marsh, a tropical rainforest and a living coral reef in there. And the engineers, you know, were were naysayed when they came up with uh, pumps to produce that because conventional pumps would have taken all of our fish and other marine biota and pulverized them. And so digging deep and understanding the context, they came up with vacuum pumps. So they, they gently lifted up, I think it was something on the order of 10,000 gallons, 40,000 liters of water into a, a chamber and then released it to produce gentle tides. So when the engineers actually got it, that you know what their role was, they were super high morale. And they were like, you know, how come we don't go through this kind of uh, context when we do stuff out in you know ordinary life? So I think that, you know, part of our re-education and dismantling of our infrastructure is every ecologist should learn engineering and every engineer should be deeply versed in ecology. And that should be a requirement. Would, would, you, would you say that's kind of one of the main take homes uh, from 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 the work with biosphere two then and putting that into some sort of blueprint for the future. Yeah, you know, we, we haven't mentioned the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene either way apparently is correct. You know, people are beginning to, and geologists are considering we're in a new geologic era and it's sort of obvious, you know, the main factor you're saying humans are the most, or, you know, the Russian soul is humans are the most unstable element in the ecosystem. Well, humans are also kind of, uh, a geologic force in our modern biosphere by our numbers, by the materials that we use, by, you know, by all of our activities, you know, and, you know, living or thinking about our biosphere without really getting your mind around human activities, cities or ecosystems. Um, there was a wonderful series of UN conferences. I gave some talks at the ones that were in Australia. Cities are ecosystems as well. And they're you know, the, what happens in cities kind of shapes what happens on the planet right now. So redesigning the technosphere, again, this is borrowing from the Russians. There was a guy named Vernadsky who predated Lovelock, 
who understood he he came up with the uh, the our basic modern understanding of the biosphere the biosphere is not and life isn't just a passenger on planet earth it's been here for you know pushing 4 billion years and it's transformed you know the earth that we see you know is obviously geologic geology is at work but it's also been profoundly shaped and changed by the action of life so vernatsky saw that the biosphere and the technosphere had to be reconciled and i think that's what we were what we had the insight when we called our institute ecotechnics so you know the the blueprint for a successful human future is to rethink everything about our technosphere let's not take it for granted i mean and i i love histories of technology where it wasn't inevitable that they would use fossil fuels to power automobiles there were other options it's not inevitable almost any technology and i think you know again why i love this mantle this mantle and reassemble in a better way actually by the way at our ecotechnic projects, we have a rule because we like people to be wild and, you know, you've got to express yourself. So we have the saying, you can break anything, but then you have to replace it with something equal or better. Uh, so we need to, <laughs> we just, we need to re-examine and dismantle because a lot of, a lot of what we do economically and technologically does not make sense. It may make profits and power, but it doesn't make sense for people who, want to live with a vibrant and regenerating biosphere. So redesigning the technosphere. So that process of even of designing biosphere two, even if we hadn't had a project was immensely successful because we saw in action, the interaction and the education, both of the ecologists and of the uh, engineers and engineers are up to it. And, you know, my God, new generations of engineers who are not, you know, who are willing to say that the emperor has no clothes and half of our technology may have to be replaced. Why are we so addicted to synthetic chemicals? Who knows? It's it, it it's a wonder. I think I think it's becoming and the you know the other thing by the way about that first day back in Biosphere 2 is they put us on a golf cart to take us over to mission control for reception and all that. And we had some solar powered ones, but they put us on a, a gasoline driven, petrol driven uh, golf cart. And I remember, you know, when I smelled that exhaust and I looked around at my fellow crew members, it was like this absolute disgust. My God. We've been free of cars for two years. Why do people put up with this? And and by the way, this this COVID uh, slowing down of business as usual. I mean, there are apparently blue skies in London. I hope it's not going to go back to the ordinary uh, terrible situation where cars have priority over people and clean air is uh, a collateral victim of our industrial way of moving people around. We need to rethink that. Why put up with it? In Biosphere 2, we had an analytic laboratory. So we could see every trace gas, you know, often in parts per billion, even in parts per trillion. I think, you know, people in every city should have laboratories that every day have the air analyzed and engineers can figure out what is what is putting those pollutants there. That's one of the things when you do go into a green area, be it, you know, a small park in London or Central Park in, in New York, you you can experience how much better the air is than when you go back into the traffic congested streets. So we have to, you know, stop putting up with, and, you know, we're kind of brainwashed that this is inevitable. This is the price of having technological toys and conveniences. This is nonsense. I think that I think that seems like a a very poignant place to leave it actually, and 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 a great takeaway for for the listeners, uh, Dr. Mark Nelson. It, it's been amazing having you on for this for this chat. If you were to leave one last sort of takeaway and any further reading, what would it be? You didn't ask my you didn't ask your question about it. Is the Earth doomed? 
but I think <laughs> I never answered it. But anyway, what what I would say to is, uh, you know, calories in your food and the oxygen in the air. Don't put pessimistic and gloomy thoughts into your brain. I'm not saying be in la la land. You know, and I don't mean at all to underestimate the magnitude of the challenges we all face as a human society to figure this out and and do it better and and, uh, live with the world we need. But take uh, optimism and hope in the future and in the part you can play uh, in it as a yoga. Because if you put pessimistic thoughts in there, you won't be motivated to do your part. And I think what we learned in Biosphere 2 is there are no small or insignificant actions. That's true in Earth's environment. And, you know, I'm, I'm very partial uh, to some Buddhist teachings. The Buddhist teachings begin with change your way of thinking. So getting out of the illusion, understanding that you are a glorious part of an amazing biosphere and that we are going to make it Do not lose hope and fall in love with every little piece of the biosphere, including cities. I love cities. I love London, where where this podcast is being recorded. It is. And I feel very lucky to live in such a beautiful green city. It's it's a fantastic place. So so in a nutshell, the world isn't doomed then. You think given a fair wind and given a a bit of a, a push in the right direction, we might be okay. We will be okay. We're a survivor species and the biosphere, the biosphere is on our side. I think I end pushing our limits. The biosphere is on our side. We have allies, you know, we have fellow biospherians, you know, who know a lot, you know, from the microbes, the plants, the animals, the birds, you know, I'm sitting here giving this, uh, talking to you, you know, surrounded by hummingbird feeders. It's really nice. You know, so yeah, uh, never say die. And, and you know, the Industrial Revolution was only 200 years ago. You know, we're like kids with new toys. So sure, we're making mistakes, just like we made mistakes in Biosphere 2. Any, pro- any problem that humans have caused, we can solve. That's a great takeaway. Dr. Mark Nelson, thank again. Pick up Life Under Glass, new edition, Crucial Lessons in Planetary Stewardship from Biosphere 2. Been a real pleasure talking with you, Matt. It's been absolutely fantastic speaking to you too. Uh, you know, I've had I've had a lot of fun researching uh, Biosphere 2 in more detail further than Spaceship Earth. And I, and I, you know, I urge everyone that's listening or watching to do the same. Don't just use the documentary, get involved uh, with Mark's work, maybe get yourself a copy of, of Life Under Glass because it is, you know, it's got some truly fascinating stuff and, and it's not just to do with the experiment. It is very extremely poignant and relevant to to this world that we're all uh, living and breathing and walking around in at the moment. So I think that's really, really important to remember. All right, so I'll sign off as we do here. Adios, amigo. <laughs> Adios amigo to you too. Thank you so much, Dr. Mark Nelson. Okay. Cheers. Cheers.